Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to our arts and journalism session. My name is Alexandra Pearson. I'm the associate editor of American Theatre Magazine, and I'm also here to support today. TCG welcomes you to our conference and thanks you for coming. We also want to extend our gratitude to the folks at the Court Theatre for letting us use their home and welcoming us to our city. I would now like to welcome our wonderful speakers onto the stage. Without further ado, please enjoy the arts and journalism session. Hey, hi everybody, good morning. I think we're still morning, yeah? Um, welcome to this panel, which is titled From Critique to Collaboration, Journalist Artists um, Commune for Theater's Evolution. I'm Adrian Brown, I'm your moderator um, for this fantastic conversation. I'm Associate Professor of English and Race Diaspora Indigeneity here at the University of Chicago, and also the Director of Arts and Public Life, which is um, based in Washington Park and the founder of the Chicago Critics Table. Uh, so that's who I am, and I'm going to introduce folks. Uh, I had it in alphabetical order, but maybe it's easier to do it um, from your left to right. <laughs> I think I can manage that. All right, so we'll start with Regina. Regina Victor, pronouns they, Pharaoh, is a nomadic, multidisciplinary artist originating from Oakland, California, using the divinatory tools of tarot, storytelling, and the framework of theatrical jazz. They employ the black and trans radical imagination to transmute the past to reflect the present and co-create possible futures. Theater is their dominant practice, working most frequently as a director, dramaturg, and actor. Pharaoh has developed new work at the Playwright Center, Long Wharf Theater, Berkeley Repertory Theater, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and is trained under prolific directors such as Daniel Alexander Jones, Rael Merrick Hodges, and Felicia Rashad. Victor founded their arts criticism outlet, Rescripted.org, in 2017 and was placed in the 23 and 24 New City Magazine Hall of Fame for their work. In 2017, they also founded and designed the Key, the Key Young Critics Training Program, a free 10-week critical course for youth 18 to 24. As a freelance critic, Victor has written for the Chicago Reader, American Theater Magazine, Playbill, HowlRound, and more. And this fall, Victor co-edited the Thrive Theaters of Color series of articles with Jose Salas for American Theater Magazine. Pharaoh has piloted several cultural initiatives, including McCarter Theater's Bard at the Gate, U Chicago Arts and Public Life Critics Table, the, How the HowlRound Theater Commons, National Advisory Council, and the Artistic Caucus. All right. <laughs> um, next to Regina is Amanda L. Andre, who's a playwright, um, uh, literary translator, and theater critic journalist residing in Los Angeles by way of Virginia in DC. She writes epic, irreverent pr plays that center the concealed, wounded places of history and societies from the perspectives of diasporic Filipino women, and she co-translates from, co from Romanian to English with her father. Her plays have been produced by Relative Theatrics and developed with Boston Court, New York Classical Theater, La Mama, Echo Theater, Circle X, The Vagrancy, Pasadena Playhouse, Artists at Play, and more. Her play, Mama, I Wish I Were Silver, won the 20. 22 Jane Chambers Award for Feminist Playwriting and was a finalist for the 2023 Blue Ink Award. Her other work has received finalist status with the Princess Grace Award, Eugene O'Neill Conference, Playwrights Realm, and Ashland Festival. Excerpts of her translations have appeared in Asymptote Journal and Another Chicago Magazine. Her theater critique and articles have been published in American Theater Magazine, Rappler, Howl Round, and Stage Raw, and reviews of translated literature and poetry have appeared in Hopscotch Translation, Barrel House Magazine, and more. She was named one of three rising leaders of color by Theater Communications Group in 2023. <laughs> All right. Next to Amanda is Africa Sela, um, pronouns they, them, is a Boston-based cultural worker specializing in dramaturgy, new play development, and arts journalism. With a passion for dialogue and a desire to explore new ideas in innovative ways, they value creative collaboration that strives to build community towards a more equitable world. They are a NNPN producer in residence at Company One Theater, an art ACOM fellow, <laughs> and a 2023 TCG Rising Leader of Color. Uh, and then on our end, in yellow, is Gabriela Furtado uh, Cochino. We took uh, that. <laughs> 
Originally from Brazil, um, Gabriel is a trilingual US-based writer and uh, actor, a Northwestern University alum in theater and creative writing, and current guest lecturer. She serves as a Chicago associate editor of American Theater Magazine and holds previous experience with the Kennedy Center and Emmy's Television Academy. Whether, whether she's typing a story or are on her feet in rehearsals, Gabriela prioritizes process, connection, and hope, enabling her to cultivate uplifting rooms and meaningful relationships with artists around the world. This past year, she worked on over 30 pieces for AT. As an artist, favorite projects have included The Bloody Bricks and Blows of American Dream High, um, Bloody Wedding, Water by the Spoonful, and a joyful multilingual Much Ado About Nothing. She is currently working on a poetry chapbook and revising new plays. Gabriella loves new play development, cross-genre writing, magical realism, media for youth, DEI, JB, and culturally responsive practices in education, disability justice-inspired work, expansive immigrant rep representation, and reimagine Shakespeare. Every day she tries to wear yellow and carry with her the ancestral whispers of Brazilian warmth. So what a great panel, right? Um, so the first question um, to kick us off is a kind of a, just a broad, broad question so you and the audience can get to know um, our panelists a little bit as writers, critics, journalists. So um, maybe each of you, if you wouldn't mind, um, describing your approach or criticism or your approach or commitment to theater criticism or journalism, under what conditions do you like to work and produce your best work? I think um, we know that I'm known for not having a really set approach and a lot of commitment. But <laughs> um, I think my approach to criticism has always been one of community. I think Rescripted, the outlet that I founded, was founded out of a community need, out of the fact that people were already aggregating their own criticism from audience members and having to do this kind of enormous lift of the work. Um, so I've always wanted to center the community, but also the artists, um, because when you go to um, a bar after the show, right, and you're with your friends, and you're saying, oh, I love the play, everything was great, but what was up with that one scene? It just didn't quite connect. And your friend will say, oh my gosh, yes, I know. We didn't get to it, we couldn't rehearse it, whatever. Mm. We know what we made, right? And there's a way to talk about what we made that is kind and generous, but also truthful. Mm. And so that is sort of the conversation that Rescripted was based around, was that like eye-to-eye -eye respect. Mm. Yeah, I think for me, um, because I, you know, come from a playwriting background, I'm certainly concentrating a lot on the writing and the structure um, and how everything is building upon that. Um, but I'm also thinking very much about the artists who are doing the work. Like, how is the artist going to use this review later? You know, like, what can I do for LA artists? Um, how am I also like being a steward, just as they are being stewards? Like, we are working at the craft together in our community, um, and so I think that that influences a lot, like my sense of place uh, and where I am. I think for myself, uh, especially wearing a dramaturgical hat, I always think of context, but specifically the text and subtext with that. Um, but I think I, I lead with a lot of reflection and question of like where we're meeting something in the moment. Um, I oh, oh, it's loud. <laughs> um, my approach comes first of all, from a place of humility. Mm. I think it's a beautiful thing to position oneself as a lifelong learner and to understand that each piece is its own piece. I don't have to necessarily follow any particular formula, but at the same time, uh, you know, being young and starting in this industry, I also think a lot about Ailton Krenaki, who is a Brazilian indigenous scholar and wrote the book Futuro Ancestral. And I think about how I am in relationship to, you know, my mentors as well as young people. So I think about how am I incorporating Gen Z and um, people who are younger than me in my writing? How am I offering touchstones and entryways? And also how am I honoring the extraordinary work that has been done before me? So those are some of the ways I approach, and definitely from a place of lyricism. I have a playwriting and poetry background, and this was really my first year as a full-blown journalist. Mm -hmm. So that's a very fun thing, and I've been lucky enough that uh, folks on my team have embraced that. And lucky enough, too, that uh, on Rescriptive, there was also a kind of call for that. You know, Annalisa Diaz's piece inspired me so much and made me feel like, oh, okay, 
there's a, a community of writers that will resonate with this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Can I add something to that too about, because I'm reflecting this from what everyone said, but also being an archivist, right? That theater is so ephemeral that a lot of our approach is about trying to record things. And I know for me, that was a really big thing starting out, um, that a lot of companies just were not getting coverage. They were on press blackout. And so these black and brown theaters would make work that is not in the record. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is teaching the audience how to be a good guest, mm -hmm. right? Because if I can come in and, and mm -hmm. figure out how to navigate this space for you and what you need to know in advance, then I can help you engage with the show. Yeah, that's, it goes back to a word that um, Amanda used, I think, which was a steward. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that idea of being a steward and all the different ways one can be a steward for craft is, I think, really, and a host, um, mm -hmm. is super interesting. And I think that brings us to this question about, um, yeah, as you heard from their bios, everyone on this stage is so talented and works on both sides of the critical artist divide, right? Or in fact, that divide doesn't even make sense, it sounds like, when you're, you talk about your own work in the ways you even craft your own. Um, biographies, I think is super interesting. And I wonder if you could, I mean, I'm, I'm coming from a kind of general critic, I'm a literary critic, um, and um, I think this idea of practitioner and who also works as critic, journalist, steward is, you know, seems like it's really integral to the ways that um, um, uh, the theater communication can work. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between your creative practice, your critical or journalistic practice, if you even think, if you think about them as separately, when and how and when is it strategic, when do they feed each other, is it difficult navigating those different parts of, of the kinds of work you do, and just, yeah, how you, how you approach being all of the things that, that you are. I think there's a white patriarchal myth of objectivity in the world of journalism. And we're just gonna go right there, you know, we're gonna <laughs> name it. <laughs> and, you know, that's not true. We all bring our lived experiences, we all have our own biases. And I get very excited when people name that in a piece, but I don't think it's something that hinders it. I think it's a superpower. You know, when we're able to cultivate meaningful relationships with artists, we're able to do process first work. I don't know about you, but if, I'm going in to see a show, I can feel if the process was intimate and meaningful for the artists on stage. Like, even for people who are product first, that is something you will notice in your bones. So, of course, I want to learn and do some investigative journalism and understand what the room was like. Of course, I want to also make sure that my part in the process, my little entryway as a journalist, is going to be empowering and healing. Many times when artists approach press, they can feel apprehensive. They, there can be a kind of level of mistrust. And by having artists in the field who, I hate the word field, um, industry, who also can report, it can allow us to be in a better dialogue and hopefully also allow artists to communicate with journalists about what they would like to see in the coverage. It can help us reach more audiences too because if we have a better relationship with the theaters, we also understand where they're marketing to. We can understand what communities to reach and we can shoulder problems along with them. Journalism is under attack. Theater is under attack. And why not be under attack together, you know? We can help one another during this time. We don't have to be adversaries. I was just gonna say point blank period. Um, but I resonate a lot with what Gabriella shared. I think for me, it's like having the industry knowledge in my other roles, I think there's an advantage to um, what I also have is an intention of being in conversation with the artists and bringing the audiences along. I think often um, in the past when we have used criticism or journalism, it's been sort of a siloed conversation. And I think we're at a time where we need to break barriers and be more transparent in the process versus product, um, but also where are we going and how are we bringing others along in that journey? So, <clears throat> I think the story that's kind of coming to mind for me with this question, um, uh, a month ago, I was uh, in the Czech Republic for the International Association of Theater Critics Young 
uh, critics workshop. And so we were seeing all of this world theater, you know, in languages that many of us maybe were not familiar with. Uh, and there was this one show that I went in with the critic mindset and I was like, I, I hope I can, you know, write something about this piece. I'm not obligated to, but I would like to if I can. And, and I couldn't. <laughs> it just, it was, but it was fascinating because like within this like two and a half hours, there was, it sort of switched where I was like, I don't know if I can view this show as a critic, so I'm gonna kind of start viewing it like as a playwright and like what are these other aesthetic elements that like could be transported, um, could be used in like my own work or if I were going to help a playwright with another work. And I feel like the, it's, it's like, you know, when you're at the, the eye doctor and they're switching that thing and they're like, is it clearer here or clearer here? You know, so I feel like those perspectives are going back and forth when I watch a show. And I wish, you know, my, my wish would be for like playwrights to write pieces of critique and for critics mm -hmm. to also write plays. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and like insert art form here, right? Like to do some light design or some sound design or, you know, just to get into the rehearsal room. Because I also think the questions that I would ask as a dramaturg and like using like the Liz Lerman um, feedback structure and things are, it's not necessarily the same set of tools that I take when I come to writing um, a piece of criticism. Mm -hmm. So it goes, yeah, it just, 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 just does this, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that dramaturgs make the best critics. I'm very biased, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I am a dramaturg as well. But I do think there's something so natural about that relationship. Um, dramaturgy is being an audience advocate at its finest. I think you're always looking at the play and saying, okay, but how does it translate? Okay, but what does this metaphor mean? Is it actually linked to the script? How are we going to explain it, right? In that way, give it context in that way, rather. And I think. Um, I'm thinking a lot about making the way right now um, because a lot of how it relates to my artist critic practice is I just was looking, I was so young, and I was looking out at all of the critiques that people far older than me were getting that felt so severe and unhelpful and threateningly career ending and I was like, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna survive one of these. Like if I get one, it's over. Mm -hmm. And so how do we change the environment in this really urgent way, like before I had a production kind of way, um, so that there would be some language that existed that explained who I was and what I was mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. And that expanded into who are my teachers and what are they doing? Mm -hmm. And that expanded into what is the scene that I'm trying to be in and what are they doing, right? And so it kind of built on itself. Now, um, I did just close Rescripted, and I think that is also not the end of my critical steward journey, though. It's just that my stewardship has really shifted. Um, I've been working as a cultural steward. More often mm. than not, I've been working with an organization called the Bombay Beach Biennale, mm. um, and it's like a town. It's a, so it's a civic-engaged uh, arts festival, and doing that work has been its own social critique. It's been a critique on pharmaceuticals because it's the largest place where, li the largest lithium deposit in the country, mm -hmm. right? It's a, it's a class conversation because it is one of the most um, mixed communities in terms of economic levels I've ever been in, right? And so there's a different kind of criticism that is embodied. But I do think my criticism has always been embodied. Like I think when we talk about artist, critic, steward and blurring those lines, I have physically put my body in spaces to blur those lines. So the idea that a critic can't go to an opening party, I would determinedly like stay for the first 30 minutes. Just to mm -hmm. be like, we are part of your community. Mm -hmm. We are celebrating you. And critics will say, well, I can't do that because I might talk about the show. Mm -hmm. I would just tell people, I usually don't stay because I'm gonna talk about the show. Mm -hmm. And if I'm too excited, I'll leave. <laughs> but that's such a compliment. And you can kind of know that it's really nice, right? Um, and then, you said theater is under attack, you know, and I'm thinking about theater as um, the sacred, you know, I really think about it as the last place we can ask ourselves difficult questions, ask ourselves what ifs, go through alchemical processes without pain and cost to our bodies and minds, right? It's a designed container. And there's something about that heart of society being the first thing to go that is a tell and not a problem. And that's why it's decomposition instead of collapse. We just need to take it apart and figure out what's going on and where we're changing. Mm -hmm. um, this is fantastic. Um, uh, I have so much to I want to pick up on, but maybe I'll go back to um, what Gabrielle said about objectivity, right? And the, the kind of 
um, uh, the positionality of objectivity and the falseness of ob objectivity, right? Objectivity is always, um, for some, maybe an aspiration, but it's never, it's never, no one can ever be fully objective. Yeah, and just we're not AI, you know, we're not robots, and even AI is getting fed existing knowledge, so. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. Um, and so, I mean, I just was interested in, you know, some of the myths of the heroic critic, right? The objectivity as one. Well. I think you're, hitting on another, right, which is about kind of isolation, doing the work in remove, that there has to be a barrier between the critic and the work, right, to be able to adjudicate it. Um, and I wonder if we, you could, I think you all are all talking a little bit about this, but I wonder if you could talk more about um, community for criticism and journalism, what that looks like, what you want it to look like, um, how to think about operating um, what kind of larger critical and journalistic communities are you a part of? Um, and how does community kind of, yeah, what are the different ways of thinking about criticism, journalage, journalism, and coverage that isn't reliant on that, that kind of myth of the need for isolation or remove to, do, to tell the truth about a, a, a work or something? Yeah. I can talk a little bit about that. Um, Earlier I was talking about um, my own artistic shift from the one, the one says, one might do, <laughs> one could say, right? That sort of royal one that was in the theater criticism um, that I then um, pretty abruptly shifted to an I because I was like, well, if you're talking to your friend who uh, loves Marvel movies and they're like, I really did not like the new Wes Anderson film. You're like, okay, yeah, I know. That, but that makes me, who likes that movie, maybe want to go see it more, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that idea of subjectivity allowing for specificity. And I'm now moving just myself artistically into a we and an us. Mm -hmm. And I think this speaks, and I'd be so curious to hear from some of the other folks on the panel about their experience of community because that community has formed kind of up and around and, and through my career, but it wasn't there at the beginning. Um, and so I think my solution was to um, meld into the artist, to be like, it is the, the I, but it's also all of us, and kind of move in that space. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of my most favorite pieces actually was about something that was produced here at the Gospel at Colonus, directed mm -hmm. by Charlie Newell. Um, and that was a really special experience because I had such strong subjectivity to that work, <laughs> right? Like I had uh, been on staff when we'd done the first installment with the same cast, Oedipus Rex, and then I wanted to follow the production to the Getty, which is a thing that I just do not think would have happened had I not been an artist. Like I think inviting a journalist in for a full week when you really are trying to move something to an outdoor amphitheater with, without, with a different shape of band and, and decibels are different and you're relying on a, a completely different structure for the piece felt very intimate and very vulnerable. And so that blurring of community for me has always been a gift and a pleasure. Um, but I feel like in terms of artistic, in terms of journalistic community, I felt like I had to grow my own. I mean, that's where the Young Critics Mentorship Program, I was thinking about this. I was like, the audacity of me to think that I could train critics the year I became a critic. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious, but, <laughs> but it came from like, I really want other writers and I don't know how else to foster them than to share what I'm learning right now. Mm -hmm. And I've always been that kind of teacher mentor. I'm always learning what I'm teaching in the moment. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that, that, um, thinking about like the I and the we and, and the one, it's, it's interesting because I think um, it's through criticism that I found more confidence because I think also as you know, folks of color and of the global majority, uh, there's that struggle for authority mm. and how does it come out in the writing and how are we authoritative and also, like what is authority, right? Like what does it mean when you are the writer and in this, or the critic and in this position and, in or out of the community. Like, I love also the talking about like the blurring and the porous lines and, you know, this like liminal space of being the artist critic steward. It is very liminal. You are like shape shifting, I feel. Um, so so that, is, that is resonating with me, just like on a craft and a technique level, like what pronouns and nouns we are choosing to use as we write these pieces. Um, and then also thinking about community building. Um, I am so hungry for that kind of training that you are like, come bring it back. <laughs> no, but you know, um, I you know, I, I guess I can sort of speak to what I see in LA. I do love, uh, I do love that like Stage Raw, one of the outlets that I write for, has you know youth fellowship programs. Uh, I think because like I didn't 
come to criticism until much later. I don't feel like that was something that was necessarily offered to me as like a young person or something that I thought um, I would be engaging with. So these kinds of fellowships that are backed by organizations, these kinds of training opportunities, um, NCI and the, you know, the, being with the rising leaders of color has been very helpful for getting me like up to speed um, on these things. And I will say also just, I feel like everyone these days has a sub stack. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I have like, I've thought about like 20 different sub stacks that I've wanted to start. <laughs> um, and, and that's, I think that's just like an area that I'm kind of just keeping my eye on as well, because I'm also recognizing that it can be a very intense project to take on and then, and then we can burn out. And you know, we don't want to burn out like candles. We just want to keep burning like stars, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I will speak to, uh, sort of still finding community, and a lot of it had to do with the pandemic. And ironically, becoming a critic happened when I was in the pandemic. Um, and to create some context, it was, I had just graduated in 2019, the pandemic happens, <clears throat> I move home, and in Boston, there was a large flight of young artists of color leaving to the Midwest, to LA, or taking um, opportunities that were not available before. And so a lot of my community actually started online and sort of hybrid as we were navigating the pandemic um, locally through the Young Critics Program, which was actually started by the Front Porch Arts Collective, which is the only black uh, theater company in Boston. And so suddenly I go from that to um, the BIPOC Critics Lab by Jose Solis mm -hmm. and that being online and not knowing what was really next. And so seeing the rise in um, opportunities like this, and then now the rising leaders of color, um, a lot of my community is scattered and mm -hmm. sort of navigating, you know, the local to, you know, regional to uh, a national community has been sort of interesting because of how technology has, in a way, supported that sudden growth and also, in a way, limited it because we're still navigating accessibility mm -hmm. um, is something that I reckon with as a journalist because in a way, yes, I have suddenly all the currents of what is going on in my community, but how do you stay in touch with even um, the local, mm -hmm. um, especially as people are coming back or as theaters have shuttered down. Um, but I think it's important to figure out, you know, how are we entering the blurred lines? Because I feel like where I am now, it's sort of like, as you reach for something that is intangible, you're feeling a, a, a spark of something that like, I'm hungry to figure out what that is. Yeah, it's been a really interesting time going into spaces here in Chicago. You know, I'm the Chicago associate editor and historically American theater editors have been in New York. So for Chicago to have its own dedicated office sponsored by the Walter Foundation is a really exciting thing. And for people to be able to put a face to an institution can be really helpful. So that piece of community has been really beautiful, just people realizing like there are humans behind the screen and humans who can take the time to listen to them. There was a piece that I wrote this past year that I was really, really proud of and grateful for, Tomorrow's Tomorrow's and Titania's, a piece that uh, weaved in both personal experiences of mine in the field as an artist and uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. And through that experience, I not only became even closer with the people I interviewed, but also a lot of people have reached out to me over email, um, sharing their own experiences. And it's a very magical thing to be able to have a national community and also kind of have a bird's eye view of what's going on in this crazy time, in this crazy world. But it can also be a little isolating in some ways because you don't always get to go deep. Mm -hmm. So I get excited about those moments in which we can go deeper, in which we can have gatherings like this and have longer in-person conversations with people and understand, you know, like, let's make a group chat. Let's create a writer's circle, an accountability check-in situation. I think about the legacy that American theater has. Michelle Merman was part of that really beautiful documentary, The Rest I Make Up, following Maria Irene Fornes. And I get really excited about forms of journalism that aren't like, it's not fully journalism, you know, it's also a piece of art. It's a, it's a mixed genre situation. And the opportunity to follow someone or a project over a long period of time really entices me. And I think that's what I'm looking forward to in the future you know, to cultivate those deeper connections. Yeah, just to pick up on a thread, I mean, what seems to be emerging from the conversation, right, is that this is a time of um, 
where arts criticism and coverage is in a time of real flux, right, for lots of different reasons. There are opportunities and there are things that feel like threats, right? And I think you've kind of been so good as, pa as panelists thinking about both of those things, right? The pandemic, right? And coming out of the pe pandemic, technology, Zoom, creating community, but also AI, <laughs> what that might mean for the future of all different kinds of arts production, Substack, right? New, new sites of distribution, right? Um, that also have come out of um, uh, the dismantlement of other forms of distribution around mainstream um, press and media, right? And so I wonder if you might talk a little bit about, uh, you already are, but just an, an more occasion to, to kind of think about where the figure of the critic and coverage is fitting in this kind of, ch so many things are changing, right, in the arts ecosystem and how the role of the, of the critic and the journalist is evolving um, in ways that you kind of find really exciting, but also you're like, ooh, I wish that didn't evolve so much. Um, and um, how that work is getting done. Where are the opportunities and where are the, the po points of kind of threat or, or worry about um, um, the role of, of the critic or the journalist? Sit with this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking a little aspirationally. But I hope that in the same way that I'm kind of shifting in and shifting out, like criticism was a medium for me, is what I have realized, right? To talk about the world, to be a cultural critic, but so is directing a play. It's the same thing, it's a smaller container, in many ways it can be. Right, And so there's something about that shifting in and out of being a critic to being an artist and doing them at the same time and allowing those positions to have turnover. right? Because I think a lot of what is happening too is, is the bottleneck of limitless potential. A lot of people come into this field wanting to be a critic. A lot of people can't make a living mm -hmm. because the jobs aren't moving. Mm -hmm. And so you, know, you do it for free for seven years and you go back to being an artist. Like that is the cycle that I found myself in. Right, And so I would hope there is more money for individual critics because I will say like the number one thing to your point about substacks, the thing that I do like to tell all my students is like do make a site and make it separate from your name. Like try to make a brand that is just not your name because it could become so many things in the future. It could be something that you want to eventually sell. It could be something that expands to, have, to be inherited, right? But there's something about perceived professionalism that like if it's, it, I, every scripted is just a word. It's just a word and I used it enough, people believed it was a thing. And because, you know, I mean, that's really what it is. And time is your best friend. Dedication is your best friend. That's why I made that joke about commitment earlier. Mm -hmm. right? So that's one musing about it. Mm -hmm. So something that I um, think about, uh, so my mother was a journalist um, in the Philippines. Uh, in, in Europe, she was also like the press attache for um, the Romanian embassy in the Philippine, uh, the Philippine embassy in Romania, which is you know how she met my father. And then she came to the U.S. in the 80s, she and my dad, and she was a freelancer and she was a journalist. And um, I, I don't even know what she would say now because I <laughs> about me. But it's funny because um, I, for a long time, actually resisted journalism because I sort of saw how it can drive one's health into the ground. Mm -hmm. You're like responding so quickly and I feel like you don't necessarily have the support to, especially like in the States to, I th I, anyway. So it, um, it, health, I think, critics and health, cause I was like realizing too, I was like, you know, we're out on like a Friday night and then we spend the weekend writing and mm. you know, things like that. It's sort of like not a n normal, oh, normal, job or whatever, um, so, so just keeping your health in mind. Um, and then another thing I was thinking about too is, you know, the Philippines is one of the most dangerous countries for journalists. And so I think I sort of carry that, that's sort of like in my like collective memory, even though I may have never like experienced a real threat in the US, but then when you're also like diasporic and you're going back and forth, like it, you, you think about it in a way that I think some critics in the US like maybe haven't had to think about it. Um, so that's, especially it's like we're talking about getting more critics of color um, and like talking about immigration. It's just like something I think I just want us to keep in mind that some of us have these like 
legacies of danger around criticism. And um, there was a recent story, I think, about an art critic who, who criticized, um, who wrote a piece about a, a TikToker who had an art gallery show, and then the, um, the followers started like trying to dox him. <laughs> uh, so that's also, again, like these are just, you know, I'm just kind of like observing what's happening. Uh, and especially like in a changing technological landscape and in a landscape where our backgrounds are coming more with us into the forefront as we are sort of like accelerating in this space as well. Yeah. Mm. I'm just gonna hop in, cause that's really real for me. Um, <laughs> like being a Brazilian immigrant and uh, having to have been very careful growing up with what I post, and I still carry that with me even after getting citizenship, just because of stories that you hear, you know, it's something you carry with you. And certainly um, the legacy of dictatorship has stayed with me from Brazil, but what I found most shocking is the wave of censorship here in the United States. Um, and now we're, you know, we're having to face things as journalists wherein perhaps we want to uplift a particular theater, but the theater maybe doesn't want us to cover their show because there's a drag queen in it, and if mm. more people know about it and it gets out, they will lose funding or they will have like bomb threats. It's a very shocking time, you know, coming from a country like Brazil. I, I thought, you know, I was gonna go to this country full of wealth, full of opportunity, full of safety, and that's not the reality, and that's sad. But I think to your point about separating and trying to keep those things, I'm very lucky in that right now I'm not a critic, I'm a journalist. And so I go in, I do my analysis, I, I say, hi, yay, love, and then I go. Um, <laughs> but you know, what happens when I observe something like perhaps an access barrier and I want me to talk about that? What happens when I need to start to you know, risk those relationships? That's something that I imagine will come up more and more and hopefully I'll have the answers one day. I'm gonna go away next week to the National Critics Institute. I'm gonna go away to the O'Neill. So maybe I'll come back with further insight, but I think that just having those conversations and going straight to the people is very important. I learned a lot through the Chicago Theater Standards and having different pathways of communication. And I do always operate, uh, for better or for worse, from assuming best intentions. So that's what I will continue to do for now as I try to keep those things separate and just ask people, what was your intention? And sometimes I might be wrong. And what's also fun is you can always go back and edit the article if, you know, you find out more information later. And that's okay, too. So also having grace in that, like, yes, you might be backed by a very fancy, well-known outlet. But I've also seen circumstances in which, you know, the New York Times also makes adjustments. You know, you do all your due diligence, and still there might surface more information. There might be someone you didn't talk to. So exhausting all your sources has been really important to me in that. Um, but recognizing that... Mm -hmm. I might have blind spots. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rumi. Mm -hmm. um, this is such a great conversation. Um, I want to pick up um, a little bit of, uh, we started to talk a little bit about um, uh, diversity, incubating diversity um, in criticism, which I think is, and in journalism as well, I think there's more attention maybe than ever right now um, to the issue um, um, and the need to, to diversify who has the authority to judge work and who's in the room and whose voices get not just listened to but upheld, who can advance in careers. Um, so there seems like there are an increasing number of programs and projects who are thinking about these questions. I've, I've founded one, the Chicago Critics Table, think about um, uh, black and brown critics in, in Chicago, but there are many, right? Many of which you've all, you all have participated in. Um, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about, um, what's the question, like what kind of resources do we need to kind of produce lasting change, right? Um, I think there's a lot of effort to incubate new talent, but then what, what happens after incubation? What, how do the structures have to continue to change? Um, what feels like, where is their promise and where does it feel like there is a lot more um, struggle still to come to change who's in the room and, and who, who is treated like, um, uh, and who's paid <laughs> like um, an, an, an authority and a voice um, uh, on work. Mm. 
Africa. Africa. I'd love to hear about what it's been like in Boston for you all. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I'm going to speak from the eye where um, I have a lot of mixed history with Boston through my father, um, as I'm just a transplant. But um, Boston is still reckoning racially around theater criticism, where when I was with the Front Porch Arts Collective, um, while like uh, there were these well-known, well-intentioned um, theater critics, you know, mentoring us about what goes into a theater criticism. There was no space at the time for me to speak about my lived experience or um, really be able to talk about why I felt so disconnected to um, a theatrical piece. And so even just having mentors to really talk about those things, mm -hmm. like in just that ge uh, geological space was really hard. But um, I think, you know, due to this pandemic and Zoom being accessible, like having mentors like Jose Solis, um, Juan Michael Porter III, Kyle Turner, like these folks were telling it as it was, um, especially in figuring out like what was the best medium for you, right? Like writing is for me because I'm an overthinker and I appreciate that. <laughs> but like, you know, um, Shea, who was an amazing facilitator with Jose um, in the BIPOC Critics Lab, like taught us what TikTok was and how we can use it to talk about criticism and whatnot. And so I think there was, um, with having BIPOC mentors, like having, I hate using the word permission, but like knowing that it was possible that you don't have to do it in such a, a formal way, right, through a, a very white patriarchal lens. Um, but I think other than like the investment in that incubation, like I do think about too, like beyond the the program, how do we still network? Like I think TCG and HowlRound are wonderful examples of how you break down those barriers. But I remember even when I was in the Front Porch Arts Collective and we were like talking with local mentors, there was like, I think the program is called Cision. And like essentially it's a database for you to connect with, you know, all of these other PR um, folks from newspapers or theaters, and there's still a barrier behind that. Mm -hmm. So if you are someone who is not of a certain prestige or you're coming up from like a a local, you know, non theatrical background, like how are we supporting those artists to be in conversation with us? Sorry, I ended up with a question, but. <laughs> a great answer. <clears throat> I really, I'm just so tempted to be like, how much do you guys think that we get paid? Like, for review? <laughs> like, I'm actually like genuinely kind of curious. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I would accept answers. Like, <laughs> just guess. How much do, do you think we get paid to write a review? Any, at a paper? Thank you, 100. 45, okay, thank you. 60, 75. Yeah, these are close. When I was working uh, at, I think, New City, I was paid $15 a review. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Windy City Times, 25. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so, <laughs> and I think the reader was 45 and then 150 for like interview pieces, right? Like bigger pieces. But uh, Rescripted, that was a big thing. I was like, I wanted to pay $50 a review. Couldn't afford it. But, <laughs> but I was like, you know, it might drastically reduce what we are able to do, but we need to kind of embarrass people <laughs> into paying more because it's like if I do not have a budget, if I do not have funders, then, like, how can we start to show people that this is the absolute minimum? Mm -hmm. um, and it's still not enough. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still mm -hmm. not enough. And so thinking about, you know, if you're seeing six shows a week, and you're reviewing those shows at $50, you're making $300 a week. How are you supposed to also be going to your day job? How are you supposed to have children? How are you supposed to do anything at all, really? Um, and I'm not gonna lie, like, Chris Jones be working hard. Like, that man goes <laughs> to more shows than I would ever want to go to, do you know what I mean? And that is why, like, he gets to be the authority is because of that level of commitment. But there's reasons that he's able to do that. I mean, there's the point at which he entered the field. There's the fact that his job is able to tailor around him a little bit by now. He's been able to form that theater criticism in the Tribune um, in a way that, like, people of color are not permitted to do. That's why I had to form my own thing and try to just figure out how I could be consistent. Right. But I think, you know, I hate to just be like, it's money, it's money, it's money, but it's money and it's not that much money. I mean, I think that's the thing. The, the critics table is the only reason that Rescripted is not already closed. You know what I mean? Because I was able to be paid to invest in my criticism. And I always say your budget lines are your values. 
Mm -hmm. right? So if you're investing in something, it says to me, oh, it's valuable, I'll keep working. And an artist will always produce three times more the value than the grant you give them at minimum. Like, we just love to be smiled at and told they're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest will take care of itself. So, you know, it's money, but it's not, it's not a barrier for some of the resources we're working with in this field. It's more of a redirection. It's a value assessment more than a monetary assessment. I like to say that um, everyone deserves a Gerald Raymond Fierce. Um, that's been my supervisor and has just been like a very, very fierce advocate for me. And I wish for everyone to be able to have a supervisor or someone in their corner who can show them the ropes, be very, very transparent about what they do or don't know about where money is coming from, about where the next professional development opportunity is coming from, about opportunities for growth within an institution, um, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in not being the only person of color at my organization, but I mean, that's all I can hope for everyone is to not be the only one, to not be the first, because um, that's a very sad thing. Sometimes people celebrate that and it's like, no, that, that's actually a heartbreaking thing. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a bit of a shameful thing, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I crave that and I crave figuring out where we get our health care from as people who do journalism and are artists. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it's, it's something that I'm, I'm navigating. I think everyone is navigating and also as you know, we do mo multiple things in that multi-gig life. How are we figuring out when to go to one thing or another? I would like for it to be around the art, but sometimes it has to be around, you know, how am I going to get my meal? How am I going to get to my health care? How am I going to be able to live and be a person? Mm -hmm. So, big questions, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know you were asking us about structures, and it was so interesting, because my first thought was like, well, maybe if we could like split up the 405 into several different, like, <laughs> I'm just thinking of like the LA traffic patterns, you know? <laughs> it's like, but, but thinking about the structures and like, maybe like the architecture, like all these metaphors coming up, um, it's, it's hard, right? Like financial structures, value structures. And so it actually has me thinking, like what are ways to kind of like break up that metaphor more too? Like, cause we, we're gonna have structure kind of like no matter what, and maybe we can also like think in terms of movement, mm -hmm. like how we move. And kind of part of this is coming up too, cause throughout the conference I've, um, been attending some of the sessions about like global program initiatives um, and kind of like being a little surprised maybe by there's not enough, there's, there's not like a lot of travel, <laughs> I realize, like outside of the US from people in the US. And I think for me, just because having family living in Europe, living in Asia, that's been a part of what we've had to do. Um, but I, I'm, I really am wishing for more like physical cultural exchange and us being like taking the time to be, you know, like to go to other countries and be more than tourists. And again, that costs money and it costs time. And like, how are we gonna do that or like make space for that in our lives? How will like institutional organizations help us with that? Uh, you know, I'm so jealous of going to this critics conference and all the critics talking about their like Erasmus years where like they yeah like these other European countries you yeah. you go and you like live in another country for a year and it's like a long-term study abroad and I I just was so like oh I'm so jealous <laughs> um, but like yeah just fostering that kind of cultural exchange that is like very embodied and putting us in in different places um, Again, like no solutions, just thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, you just reminded me. I'm old. You just reminded <laughs> me of a formative experience, which was I went to Egypt. I didn't take an Erasmus year, but I had to take a gap year because I was young. So I, I went mm. to Egypt, um, and I, it was during the Arab Spring. Mubarak was in prison, mm. and I was there for a month and a half. And I remember we were on our way back to the hotel and our uh, guide, Nancy, she was like, oh yeah, like there's a peace demonstration down there and they were chanting back and forth in Arabic and it was Christians and Muslims uh, in a pavilion, right? And I get back to my hotel and the BBC is on. <laughs> 
and they're like, unrest down in Cairo today. You know, and they're <laughs> yeah. showing this very protest and the sound's not even off. So I'm like, if you speak Arabic and you are watching this, you know that's not even what they're talking about. And the way that I realize the press will just lie on your ass, excuse me, on you, <laughs> but they will just lie on you, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I think my, my neuro spiciness was very like, I don't do good with inconsistencies. Like that's really mm. like how the script did start. And we talk about structures. Just set, do what you say you will do. Mm -hmm. Be about what you said you'd be about. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that integrity is such a big part of criticism and sort of the, the calling of the thing. Something I would love from structures, I would love for us to critique each other as critics. Mm -hmm. This is something that I was <laughs> kind of shamed for, <laughs> for at the last TCG because I really didn't know. I was like, but why wouldn't you want to do that? And the room laughed at me openly. <laughs> and they were like, we might say something at an ATCA conference, but we would never critique another critic in public. And I was like, but don't you care about like the integrity of your, of your field? Like, and this is something I'd been stepping in for years and not mm -hmm. knowing it was even like a faux pas. I just thought that was what we do because the great critical conversations I was educated on are intense and cool and they're like, you write back and forth. Every time I wrote something about a critic, I expected them to write me back in their paper mm. like mm. and i was so confused when that didn't happen you know so that is not necessarily to the question but just some musings and responses from these brilliant people something i get excited about too is when people can have like different approaches to that kind of critical conversation me coming from a world of playwriting like i i, lo I love to give non-prescriptive feedback and figure out how i can position myself knowing that i'm also not the authoritative voice and no one is the authoritative voice the person with whom i'm speaking is not the authoritative voice i have to remind myself sometimes because I'll be in a room fangirling, but no, you know, um, and, and my perspective is as valid as anyone else's, but yeah, just using the tools of playwriting and dramaturgy to critique. I mean, we've been talking about this again and again, and this has been going on for a very long time. You know, Sarah Arul just wrote a piece for us on theater and loneliness. Like, this is, this is not a new thing. This is just something we're craving more of, and we would like to re-energize during this moment in which a lot of outlets are not necessarily valuing arts journalism and they're not valuing it because that's not where they're putting their budget. Mm -hmm. I wanna like say this, cause I feel like this is a thread during this conference, but like the first thing that comes to mind, I think tying into Gabriella's and Regina's um, testimony is really like, we need to really be in the space of educating and teaching. Um, and I say that like really making it clear like there's representation and tokenization and we shouldn't follow one or the other. I think there's a gray space in, in some regard because of the spaces in which we rely on community to learn these things. Um, but I also think of the uh, thematic thread I've been hearing in some of the spaces I've been in of like when we bring in uh, leaders of color or emerging um, artists of color into these spaces, how are we platforming their success where we're not failing them? Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing that a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, before we open it up to the audience for their questions, I'm gonna ask one more question about audience. <laughs> uh, look what I did there, clever. Um, uh, to ask each of you to just talk a little bit about how you think about your audience, the reader, who is that for you in your mind when you're sitting down? And you, and how do you kind of think about readership um, um, generally as you are producing work? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, 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 um, I guess I kind of assume that like the artists are reading my uh, critique kind of first and foremost. So that's always in my mind. I'm thinking about like, okay, the theater company is good. And I think that also comes from the fact that like people who have told me that they've read my criticism have been the artists. So that's like, you know, some, um, some kind of like evidence right there already. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm writing for the artists uh, and also kind of like the archive, mm -hmm. whatever that might be, like the future researcher of LA theater mm -hmm. who's gonna go in there and like translate my English into whatever language they speak in. Mm -hmm. 2,500, um, and, uh, and then in a funny sort of way, I think I'm also just reading, uh, writing for the curious reader, because when I was a kid, I used to read the food critics section by Tom Sietzma in the Washington mm. Post, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always was like, how does he do this so well? <laughs> you know, like, how does he distill this experience so well into, 
you know, like like 600 words, like, oh, it's so cool. And then, you know, like go on to read the Garfield comics. But like, it really, it sticks in my mind um, and, you know, helps to get that, have a journalist mom getting the paper every Sunday. But, but I do hope that there are folks who are just reading it and like want to also just read a beautiful piece of writing um, about a show that maybe they saw or didn't see and are like, oh, that's cool. Um, maybe I'll remember that name later and like see that play rate later, later that theater company later. I think uh, going off of the piece on when you were younger, I think my audience is always a young person. Um, I, I do a lot of work in education. A lot of my plays are for young adults. And you know, I will never forget the experience of reading all of these publications that we've been talking about when I was younger. And there's a very specific article that found me when I most needed it. And we never know as writers when that will be. We don't necessarily speak with face-to-face -face all of our readers, but there was one article in The Atlantic about Amelia Bassano and the question of authorship. And I had always felt in my bones, you know, I know that there's a space for me in Shakespeare, I'm just not being allowed it. Mm -hmm. And I really, really needed to read that at that time. So I write with the hope that it will find the person that it needs to find, but always figuring out how can I excite young people because oftentimes they are, I'm sorry, the most innovative, the most like, ah, it's a crazy <laughs> time when they're growing up. They just have the most revolutionary ideas and they notice the hardest human truths of what's going on wrong in society because education itself, often you know these systems that they are in from longer than they should be, and that's a whole other thing, like eight to three, whatever the time is that they are for the bell schedule, they're seeing a microcosm of our society. They're seeing that with the PTO, they're seeing that with the parents, they're seeing that with the teachers, they're seeing that with one another. And I want to hear from them a little bit more, certainly. I am always, you know, putting out an American theater like on our Facebook, like, we want to hear from you, we want to hear from you. And it's like, no, we, like, we really, really, really do. So I'm uh, excited to see also where theater companies and publications can form those partnerships. We were talking about Steppenwolf's education programs the other day and how like awesome it is that they have like the Young Adult Council. If I had been a teenager in Chicago, I would have been there 24 seven. So uh, Albany Park Theater Project, I think is an extraordinary example of theater that feeds and theater that is very, very connected to you know, the community. So what does it look like for publications to be in that more uh, 3D community? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like for me, it's really hard to imagine who my audience is because every single piece I've written, I've gotten a different response. Um, mm. But I always appreciate that. Um, but I think it's like with my hope, it is a intergenerational dialogue because I think we all have something to learn from each other, not to sound cliche, but I, I think like when we are really thinking about community, we have to be as open-minded and curious as possible as folks have already shared on this wonderful panel. Um, but that and I, I think as a dramaturg, um, other than bringing in context, I really think trying to create that transparency because I will say like sometimes I imagine my mom um, because uh, she introduced me to culture before I could even speak. And it's something that I don't take for granted. And I think it's something that I try to hold on as a value as well in my writing. Sorry, I, I'm like a little emotional. So um, I, I, it's really amazing. Like, I, yeah, it's really amazing just to hear you all talk about where you came from and the people who are supporting you is just so cool. <laughs> um, thinking about audience. So it, always a love letter to the artist mm -hmm. because you're right, like artists respond. The best review I ever got as an artist came from Sam Hurwitt. It was a production that I, he's at the Marin Independent Journal. Um, and it was a production I wasn't able to finish and so the last 10 minutes was directed by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, you know, all the things you say about an upcoming director, it's like a solid effort, blah, blah, whatever. And then at the end, it was like, but the end feels like it was done by somebody else. And I was like, oh, thank you for seeing me. Like, I just, it felt so nice to have the piece be reflected that way. So I'm always subconsciously aiming for that feeling. Um, and then the second thing is, I assume my audience is illiterate. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of people can't read. I've been a teacher my whole life. Mm. Adults cannot read, and that is okay, right? Our education system is not built for them to succeed at that. Mm. 
So I try to write something that your 14 year old can read to you, mm -hmm. right? That is always kind of the goal. I'm always going for an eighth grade reading level because that is the average reading level. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a place, like I'm so grateful actually because I got to write for Portable Gray, which is my first academic uh, review and that was very different, but I know I can write that way because it's for academia and that was liberating in a different way. But I do want people to remember, like I am an orator first, I'm a storyteller first, there's a reason that I tell stories through the body and on stage, that I was always just trying to thread those things together, right? And then you said something, Gabriella, about um, uh, teen programs, and I do think that part of why I am this way is, is in fact, TCG's fault. And <laughs> <laughs> I would like to lay blame squarely at their feet because I, um, I was part of the, the Berkeley Rep Teen Council the first year that they had us come. It was like 2011. And I remember it was me and this kid, Sean, from Steppenwolf, who's now an advocate in his own right. He's a lawyer. And uh, they told us, we want to hear from you. This conference is about you. We don't talk to you enough. And we took that so lethally seriously. We ran up everybody's back in this conference. Like, I was even thinking about that today because of the, uh, Julie Tamer was the keynote speaker. And they were like, you cannot ask about Spider-Man. <laughs> Within two seconds, me. <laughs> Do you think, you know? <laughs> and I was laughing about that today coming here like right after closing was scripted. And I was like, it's so funny because you can't control the conversation at TCG in the most beautiful way. Um, <laughs> but that audacity of like, I am the questioner absolutely comes from that gate being opened. And so a lot of gratitude to those programs and the gates they continue to open mm -hmm. and why I started my program. I'm just always trying to give back, ooh, trying to give back what is fed into me. I have to shout out, um, growing up, I was, uh, so I was between Rio and Miami, and I was able to be a part of the Broward Center Teen Ambassador Program, and that was the very first time I wrote reviews, was mm. for the Broward Center, and through this thing called South Florida Cappy's Critics. Mm. Um, and as we're looking at, uh, like, cuts to budgets, I, like, all we can do is hope, pray, and prove through research time and time again that these are invaluable programs that save lives. Mm. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, we have about 20 minutes um, for questions, so I will turn it over to the audience and try to see who I can see. I see you right there in the, yeah. Oh, there we go, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for all this, this is really, really interesting. Uh, I've been hearing about like the sort of big like existential questions of this. Um, from your perspective, uh, as you're kind of uh, going through about this like most recent election crisis, What is the purpose of theater criticism and how do we see it changing and evolving? Um, I will say for two seconds before this, I was saying, I wanna ask the audience that. I wanna ask artists, <laughs> like, what do they think the purpose of criticism is and how does it help them? So maybe we can all hold that and y'all could tell us that after we answer this. I guess I can go first. Um, and I'm wearing all hats on one, including the one I'm wearing today. <laughs> um, but I, and I think in our training, but I think more of in new play development, the question we have around the story is why now? Um, and I think a lot about new play development, not just because it is a new play, but because it does chronicle our time. And so I think with arts criticism, it gives a snapshot of a moment of where we are, either reckoning with a current event, a theme, a moment, or even the artists themselves in their journey. Um, but I think with where we are now is, is and will be a reckoning, I think, as we engage with a lot of cross-cultural and what feels like a crossroads of how we're engaging each other across ability, race, other identity markers. Um, and I, I think it's a question that should be both celebrated um, and challenged. I mean, I, I think its purpose for me anyways is, uh, well, the, well, the mission of Rescripted was to reprogram the way that we critique each other. But to me, that's also to reprogram the way that we engage with each other, right? And to uh, critically engage. I think I've, I formed it at a time 
when, when Breitbart was starting, you know? So it was like, it was a different time in media and information. Um, and so just having people check their news sources, like what, who are you reading, was really the, the thrust of that outlet. It was like, I, well, who is this I? Because you never have to think about it if it's a one, if it's a we, right? Um, yeah, keep talking about it. Interesting question about the purpose. Mm. It's a little silly to tie it back and, and be a little corny like this, but you know, the TCG's mission is to lead for a just and thriving theater ecology. And I think that that is the purpose of arts criticism. It is to lead, it is for just, right? We're gonna call people out and thriving. We want people to do well. You know, we're not adversaries once again. Um, and you know, I, I, I mentioned writing for young people. I, you know, also coming from another country and also having a brother who has a severe disability, I'm very, very aware that there are a lot of people that might not be able to physically show up to the theater. So it's a way that audiences can be in dialogue with these pieces, even if they're not physically in their seats. It's a way that non-theater goers are able to tap in. Maybe they have more questions about a piece. Maybe they didn't understand something or they want to learn someone else's perspective. It allows them to have that artist-centered conversation um, without necessarily having those connections. So it, I hope, bridges a gap. And the way that I hope to see it, you know, in the future and as it is evolving is to see more of the cross-genre piece, see more of collaborations, and uh, to enjoy seeing people be bolder with their provocations and what they wish for the future of theater. I really enjoyed yesterday a conversation at the understudy about the future of American authorship. And they talked a lot about censorship, but they also talked a lot about hope. And they talked a lot about being able to uh, write, speak their mind and not necessarily be attached to an institutional power. And so I'm just thinking a lot more about like what is the responsibility of the journalist separate from their organization? What is the responsibility of the journalist to their organization to ensure that they are, in fact, leading for a just and thriving theater ecology? Mm -hmm. This question also has me thinking about what is the purpose of my own plays and mm -hmm. my own artistry? Like, no one asked for them. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, I got into playwriting um, and I, I, I stayed with playwriting because it was actually the, the actors in the community that said, thank you for writing a play that is not going into stereotypes, like about Filipino people, like we're not janitors or maids or shoffers, like you've given us a really magical, rich play, like please keep writing mm. so that we can like keep performing these roles. And I think similarly with criticism, it became a way to also show the artists that I was paying attention. And I feel like the root for both of these as playwright, as critic is I respect you I respect your community enough to write about you, to take the time mm -hmm. to write about you and put what, what you've done or what we feel into words that someone else can take in and understand and then feel something in their bodies and change their movement in the world. Um, so I think, yeah, in some ways it comes down to just this like essential respect and dignity um, for the art, for the artist, for the audience. Um, and I know sometimes that hasn't always been the case in criticism. The one word is witness. The purpose of criticism, I think, is to witness and to be an active witness, an engaged witness. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm hearing you're saying. Mm -hmm. Beautiful responses. Thank you for that tie into the just ecology as well. That mm -hmm. was really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also love what you said, Amanda, about tying it in also to your playwriting. And something I always think about is why is it that I am writing in the medium that I am writing? And playwriting, I, I like to sit with my plays. You know, over the past few years, I wrote 10 plays, and I am in deep, 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 deep revisions of all of them. <laughs> and 
some of them have not yet seen the light of day. And I don't know when they will. Maybe they're not plays. Maybe they're children's books. Mm -hmm. But that is a marathon, not a sprint. And theater journalism, with a quick turnaround time, we are able to reach readers more quickly, which is really, 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 really exciting yeah. and also a little terrifying. Mm. Um, it means a lot of late nights. And it also means that maybe you'll be able to be engaged in those conversations a little bit quicker than a play. Mm. Um, for me, in terms of like the order of like when you'll be able to like uh, respond to a moment, you know, journalists are first responders, right? Yes. Um, yes. Plays I find are staged more quickly than films. So I, I find myself sometimes, you know, more, more eager to see what a playwright has to say than perhaps a screenwriter because their piece just won't be out quickly enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is the um, saga, the epic of the novel. <laughs> <laughs> and that is something that I'm excited to see, uh, you know, the people up here on stage. I'm excited to, like, continue to read more of your work and excited to see, to what this generation of writers will have to say in long form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge I'm posing to all of us. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, y'all. Uh, we touching our adaptations and costumes, the question I've been coming back to for years is how can theater as individual institutions support our work as, as journalists? Because like, like the conversation always is, well, Steppenwolf won't put onto a journalist because what if the journalist doesn't like So the core question is how have you, how can or how have we seen theater institutions support the work of arts journalists? Thank you. I actually could talk a little bit about that. Um, so one of the gifts uh, of the last conference that that was the I think I went to Miami at TCG and one of the gifts of it was seeing how people were addressing this this problem, um, and one really I thought ambitious venture was the Denver Center had employed a journalist to cover the entire area. And I thought that was very interesting. And I think it depends on what kind of criticism you're doing. But I think for preview pieces, for interviews, for these things that are not actually about the product forward criticism, but about the cultural context part of the criticism, I do think that those are uh, ways to approach it. Um, sorry, I got distracted. I'd be like, maybe we should divorce the product part of criticism from it. Maybe it's the only problem, but. <laughs> um, Thinking about, uh, I'm doing a program with American Theater and I believe Pittsburgh Public Theater. Um, and that'll be a mentorship program, right? That'll be, I think, a year-long course, something like that. Um, when I was doing the key, Steppenwolf donated space, Greenhouse Theater donated space. Um, and so there are these ways without funding the product or the, the actual review uh, to support criticism, I think mostly through education. I think weaving it into your education programs. The Goodman has Cindy Bandle, right? That's a way of feeding into the critical landscape because it also, it, it, I think it feeds both ways to have mentors who are working with young people reinforces the mentor just as much and keeps them in the field a little longer too. I would say if uh, journalists take the time to reach out and ask for a conversation, and then perhaps you disagree with an article, maybe take accept the invitation to have a conversation, right? And don't just like bully the journalist. Um, it's like a little silly to say, but like it's not this um, large institution. Oftentimes, you know, and people are very surprised when I tell them this. There are six editors at American Theater, and not everyone is full time. Mm. We're tiny, um, and we do our best. And we also trust our process and we trust our method and you might not know it, but if we're trusting you and trusting your art and treating it with the level of respect that we are and doing our due diligence, we hope that you'll do the same for us. Mm -hmm. And so I would say like, please, please continue to be engaged in conversation with us and we will be in conversation and we, with you. And as much as you give us the benefit of the doubt, we will give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, I also think, you know, if we're talking about like who within the theater is interfacing with a journalist, um, it's really, really important that, you know, you uh, cultivate those relationships together. It's a mutual thing, right? It's not just on the theater. It's not just on the journalist. You really have to be intentional. Um, and each outlet has their own mission. Each journalist has their own mission. But 
it, it's, I think it's exciting for people to really ask one another, like, what is your mission and not necessarily just assuming it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was gonna say, this is such a good question because I feel like there's sort of some, um, let me think. Like, I feel like there's sort of like some obvious answers with like the theaters like placing ads in, in the newspapers, but then it gets like kind of squishy too, right? Because then it's, mm -hmm. I had this problem because I was like, oh no, like I wanna be honest, but they've also paid for an ad. Um, but I think also just kind of like a cultural acceptance of like, just because they paid for an ad doesn't mean the review is gonna be glowing. So maybe kind of just like more um, understanding around that. And then something that I've been doing is like asking other theater artists um, who work in areas that I don't work, like what is something you want a critic to know when they are critiquing you? So like I asked this of a costume designer. I was like, what are we missing? You know, like and directors, like what are, what are we missing? How would you wish a critic would like talk about you? Um, so I wish there were like more conversations about that and just some kind of like forum where we could like have. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, right? Yeah, next, next, next conference. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, that was yeah. like a key New component. Project. Yeah. That, that was a key component of the key, was that every week an artist would come in and they would talk, and the critics would get to ask them what they do and like how they can better witness them and understand their work. Mm -hmm. And technicians to directors to actors, because you really can't if you don't understand the components. It's the same directing a play. Like I can't run tech rehearsal if I don't have a general idea of what the lighting designer does. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, also like, don't be scared of us. Don't be scared to create relationships <laughs> with your artists, with your journalists. Uh, I'm very, very clear when I enter a space, whether I have my journalist hat on, whether I have my actor hat on, whether I have my playwright hat on, and I will not let those things go like this, you know? Um, I, I like to say I'm like the social butterfly of American theater, and so people tell me things, and I do not share those things. <laughs> and you just like have to trust that, you know? like. Mm -hmm. I like, I promise like the people on this panel, the people you cultivate your relationships with, you trust your intuition around who you want to discuss your issues mm -hmm. with. When we think about, I also work at a university, you know, I'm a guest lecturer, and there are some people that like by Title IX are appointed to be reporters or not, and they're very, very clear about that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that same ethos applies to the work that we do and the approach that we take. Mm -hmm. Have maybe one more question in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Let me try to reflect the question first, because um, I know it. <laughs> is there, <laughs> um, but is there anything that we could have employed earlier in our careers, like as young people, just like if we things that we know now that we wish we knew then? Um, and then the second part about reflection. Will you say it again? Yeah, formative years, events from our formative years that inspired us or calcified or let us know that we were going to be a critic, even if we don't recognize them, didn't recognize them till now, because you've seen me do that a few times already. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. I'm gonna reply to the second question, because I think the first question I still need to sit with. 
Um, so I'm gonna dive in about my parents real quick. So something you should know about me, I am hard of hearing. I was born deaf as a child. Both my parents are um, military veterans. They actually met in Italy of all places. Um, so here I am right now, I'm a result of that. Um, but growing up, um, in case people don't know, a lot of military members are low class. And so for us, we would have ticket programs that allowed military families to see cultural arts programming for free. So when we first came to the States, um, we saw The Lion King. Um, we dressed up for it. I was up to the nines, and I sat in the middle row, I remember so clearly, and I had just started to hear for the first time. And I think I was like five years old, so thank you, medical intervention. But I remember seeing, you know, the artists coming down the aisle as gazelles, and I was feeling the sense of magic. I didn't know the words then, but I do now, right? And so uh, many years later, decades later, I won't reveal my age, um, I am here like knowing the machinations of what goes into that magic and really wanting to recreate it either through my writing or through my dramaturgy or really thinking about what is the experience I want to produce for someone entering a stage either for their first time or their millionth time or wherever they are in their relationship with arts and culture. And I think there's something there that again, not taking for granted that um, I want to bring into my work. Um, and so I think to your, your first question, like I wish earlier I brought that moment into my writing um, and knowing that um, A, first of all, we need more accessibility, but second of all, that like um, it's always a cycle uh, of wanting to bring someone into a theatrical or art space. Um, and it's something that I now lead as a value, especially in like wanting to create a more equitable world. Mm. Thank you. I don't know if this counts as something I wish I'd known. <laughs> I think uh, everything I ever did that was scary is okay now. <laughs> like, I'm okay, you know? So that's probably the biggest one, is you can be fearless, you will be okay. Um, I'm a big believer, I did the DIY MFA for my artistic practice, so not necessarily my cultural practice, but I was like, I can't afford school. Emotionally, I cannot afford to go back to school. Institutionally, I could not do that. So it's not even about the compensation or the tuition. I just knew that wasn't for me. But um, I decided to chase the experiences I wanted, and I curated those experiences. And I looked at people like Felicia Rashad and Daniel Alexander Jones, who were moving through the world with such kindness and such a bird's eye view of things. And I was like, I wanna be like those people, so I'm gonna go try to be around those people. I like to tell students this too. It's like when you're a student, people love to be around you. I'm gonna tell you the secret. You make us feel really good about our jobs. There's, there's <laughs> nothing I would rather do than sit for 30 minutes and talk to you about all the things that I've done and have you look at me like I'm awesome. Like, cause I have to go to a board meeting and explain to these people, you know, like, that's nice. Um, so take advantage of that time because we do like to be around you. Um, and then to the opposite point, right? Um, and hopefully this is not a problem anymore. Hopefully it's not, it doesn't seem like it is but you may never get the mentor you really deserve. Mm. And that's okay, because you can learn together, right? Mm -hmm. So just call on your people, take the late night phone calls, and you will be okay together, mm. right? But I just, when we're really, really brilliant, I do think that's a real thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> this was on the tip of my tongue too, about like being okay, um, because I think even though I knew that like people could say the most like terrible things about you, like about your family or like whatever, like oh, like as a critic oh, and like as an artist too, um, that like even if someone had prepped me for that, I, I still I still think I would have had the same, like I still needed to go through that journey of like feeling like oh my god this is so terrible everything is terrible but then like taking the time, so maybe there's something about like yeah like you're okay, you're okay, and like you need time, um, uh, and that there are, there are also like a lot, of, a lot of joys. So I guess what I'm trying to say is also, it's like, I don't know, it's just like about being like present. Um, Pre and present to your fear. I mean, that's what I really fear. hear you exactly. saying. Exactly, 
Yeah. Yeah, like not trying to pretend that I wasn't okay or yes. in certain <laughs> incidents. Right. Yeah. I know this sounds really <laughs> I felt not okay, but I am okay, you know. You but, know? But just the courage, right? And this is the tarot that that courage is actually the alchemization of your fear, it's the acceptance of your fear, it's choosing to walk with your fear, and courage and fear together become your strength over time. Yes, yes, thank you, because it's like, you, you don't know what's happening until it's happening kind of thing, you know, yes. and yes, yes, the alchemy that happens, like it, ha yes, thank you. It's a great question. Yeah, <laughs> and then, I don't know, and then just thinking about like moments, because there are so many moments, but I, I will say that like, something that's been kept, kept me going for 15 years plus has been like after writing my first play, um, my, my playwriting teacher like wrote on my script, he was like, keep writing, the world needs your voice. Yes. And that's kept me going for like oh, 15 years and running. Like, so the educators, you know, there's that real power, you know, and like when you identify that talent in, in your students and in like, you know, the folks before you, it's just like naming it. So like, I also feel like now, I also like when I'm talking to other folks who are like on their path and looking for things, like I will say things that sound so obvious, but they need to hear, I'll be like, you, you are smart, mm -hmm. you are intelligent, you're doing the right thing. And just like hearing someone else say that like means so much, yeah. And I, I really appreciate tying the spirituality piece into it. Um, I think everyone, should be able to have their own kind of practice. It doesn't necessarily have to be spirituality, that if that's like what you call it, meditation, self-reflection, self-centering, just that level of care for yourself and your spirit. Um, you're not just one, right? You're not alone. You don't have to choose to be one thing. You don't have to be like, I have to be like this kind of writer. I have to be this kind of person. I have to be like this kind of person that I look up to. Like you can be multiple, you are multiplicity. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to like pick and choose like what are the things that resonate with me. And you mentioned mentors and I've been so, so fortunate to have many and be able to like draw from different people. Someone else that has been so uh, like affirming to me has been uh, Kelsey Mesa from the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. And you know, like write those things down and like really, really let like process, like sit with it. When I was little for some reason I thought I, I just really, I, I, it hurt me to see how people in positions of power would uh, use those positions of power and be so irreverent with them. So I would enforce upon myself a level of humility in which I would even like insult myself because I never wanted to be like that. And I think that if you have that intentionality, like you're not gonna get to that point, hopefully. Like, you know, we try and like, I, I will always check myself, but it's something that I'm unlearning now still is like just, don't be unkind to yourself. Mm. Um, don't think that you should be unkind to yourself. Don't put yourself down because you're young or whatever. I always ask myself whether or not I should reveal how young I am because I think it's even silly to say like, oh, when you were starting out, it's like I am starting out. Like I'm in my very, very early 20s um, and I'm very, very grateful to be here. And I often ask myself, do I deserve this? And mm. it's always a battle and that never goes away. And so because that never goes away, work on it now and don't expect that it'll go away when you win the Pulitzer. Right, <laughs> right. Because um, yes. that used to be my thing. I'd be like, oh, like you know, like when I'm fancy, and it's like, what does fancy mean, right? What what mm. does that mean? Um, but to your other question about like those dreamy moments, and I think that's so important because you get jaded really, really fast. Um, and so thank you for asking that question. Um, I think you know when I was very, very little in Brazil, sitting in my crib, mm. my mom tells me that I used to sit up and say during Carnaval because all the theaters closed, I would ask Chato Bio which means, is the theater open? And those were some of my first words. <laughs> and Stop. I never questioned it. <laughs> and for some reason, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. And I don't know how, because obviously you can't write when you're that little. But I was like, oh, yeah, like I like telling stories. That's like very, very like, you know, of course. Mm -hmm. But everyone has winding paths. And like growing up, it's been so, so exciting to hear like people coming through like, psychology or come into theater and then out of theater and then back again and or in and out of like journalism in that way too uh it's it's really exciting and you know whatever story that you had when you were very very little know that you might come back to it there are like very mm -hmm. special seeds I'll never forget in fourth grade there was a little short story that I wrote about a drama queen superhero who defeated a villain named blank face 
who wanted to take all the color and arts out of the world. Mm. And we're seeing that today. <laughs> you know, young people know, um, like, again, I'm a very spiritual person, so, mm -hmm. you know, mm. I, I think that that's a big part of my practice. Young people are closer to those seeds of possibility prior to what happens when you are imposed the pedagogies of this world. So hold on to those seeds of possibility. Mm. Mm. Return. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Can, I, can I say one last thing? Yeah, close this out. I'm so it. sorry. I just, no, I have please. to, because you asked about the formative experience and I almost put this in my article and I didn't. And I do want to speak this story into the, into the air. So thank you all. But um, I understudied a production of Midsummer Night's Dream at California Shakespeare Theater in like 2013, 14 time. And I was understudying Erica Chong Shuch and I uh, was asked to write about the experience. And I wrote about it and just so offhand, this wonderful actor who is now at um, SF Playhouse, I believe, um, but Lauren English Clark, right? I remember she said to me, you're so fortunate that you can talk about the things that you do, that you're present to on stage. People can't do that, you know? You should keep doing that. And I put that away and I kind of like, I would write occasionally, but like I, that experience I've been snacking on and, and thriving on like since that day. I mean, it really has been an engine and I just want to say thank you to Lauren because it was really powerful for me. Mm. Yeah. Witness begets witness. Mm. <laughs> Great closing words. Um, thank you for witnessing the panel with us and thank being in conversation know. with us. Thank you to our panelists. <laughs>